never runs out on me. Your love, one last time. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out. worship if you understand the love of Jesus oh
Brothers and sisters, if we are to make sense of our faith, we have to go beyond how we feel. We have to go beyond what our circumstances are. And we have to hold on to God's word. Our faith must be anchored and grounded, not in how we feel, not in what our circumstances are, but in the Word of God. Let's worship Him some more. Go beyond how you feel. Go beyond your circumstances. God is worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be adored. If we are to make sense of this thing we call Christianity, we have to go beyond what we sense. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The real reason why we're still here is because of what we sung a while ago. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. That's why we're here. It's not because you've been so faithful. He has never given up. And you know, folks, really, for some of us, there would have been every reason for God to have given up. We have given up on other people in much less difficult circumstances. What a God, eh? What a God. What a God. We're going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 11. And we are going to be reading the entire chapter. And then the first 13 verses of chapter 12. 
because as I have been saying, Paul, in writing a letter, didn't divide it neatly into chapters and verses. He went straight through with his train of thought. And so we're going to follow his train of thought to a logical conclusion. We're reading the New Living Translation. If you are, if it's difficult for you to continue standing, you may be seated. Don't feel bad. The older you get, is the less easy it is to stand for a long time. Is that true? Have you found it to be true? We're going to read responsively or alternately, and I'd like us to try to internalize what we read. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. So Darwin is wrong. And the evolutionists are wrong. Read verse 4. was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob who inherited the same promise. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to help them. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. 
they did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. So folks, just a minute before you read verse 14. What if you are sick and God promises to heal you and you die without receiving your healing? He didn't tell you when he was going to heal you. In the rapture, you won't be sick anymore. These people didn't receive the promise. When God promises you something, hold on to it. If he promises you a husband, you know it will be before you die because there's no marriage in heaven. Read verse 14. Obviously, people who say such things are lucky for If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born, they saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to call the son of Pharaoh's daughters. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. By faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep Passover and to the Lord of the Lord so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, and the walls came crashing down. It was
was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. For she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more can he say? By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. Women received their loved ones back again from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. We're talking about God's people, you know. You didn't think this could happen to one of God's children? that they could be in such a condition? Would you like to be sawed in half? Huh? Would you like to be stoned? Or would you prefer to be destitute and oppressed? You prefer oppression to the stoning. Verse 38, read that. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet, none of them received all that God had promised. For God has promised better than for us, so that they not reach perfection with us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. And you have forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children. He said, my child... Don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father. If God is only as well as all 
So if you don't get a flogging from God from time to time, you are not his child. Tell your neighbor, if you are rude, expect a flogging. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? Discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Verse 13 together. Make Mark out a straight path for your feet. So that those who are weak and lame will not fall. Let's thank God for his word. Before you move from that position, let's just pray for Brother Orville who just was sick a while ago. Let's just Lift our prayer to the Lord on his behalf. Praise God. In the name of Jesus. Please move around now and greet several persons. Welcome them to the service today. Greet them cheerfully. Uh, 
Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you later when we come for our Lord's Supper service, I want to ask you to come believe in God for a miracle. We're going to anoint those who are sick. If you are sick in mind or in body or in spirit. And we're going to pray the prayer of faith. And believe God for your healing. And I want you to come expecting God to do something on your behalf. Amen? Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Brother Matthew Royal is coming to uh, welcome us and to tell us what's on the agenda here at Pentecostal Tabernacle over the next few days. And I believe we have at least one special announcement. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is truly a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today. And I'm sure it's a blessing we'll all make full, full use of. Um, please listen to the announcements for this week, all from beginning August 16th to August 22nd. On Sunday, today, we have a prayer time in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. At 7 p.m., we have the Lord's Supper service. On Monday, the 17th, we begin with our National Youth Corps. Now, Youth Corps is an absolutely exciting opportunity for all the young people of God to get involved in the work of ministry. So I'd encourage all of us to come out those of us who are interested in attending Youth Corps, please meet with Brother Sean Allen in the Ralph and Helen Reynolds Hall immediately after the service today. And we'd like to remind as well that if you're coming tomorrow, you have to be here by 8 a.m. There are no scheduled activities for Tuesday the 17th. Well, at 12 noon on Tuesday, at two, 12 noon to 2 p.m., we have Golden Ages prayer time in the sanctuary. On Wednesday the 19th at 6.30 a.m., morning manor, at 11.30 a.m., prayer and fasting service. And at 6.30 p.m., prayer and Bible study. On Thursday the 20th, we have youth choir practice at 6 p.m. On Friday the 21st, we have men's and women's fellowship general meetings. On Saturday the 22nd at 9 a.m., we have the funeral service for Brother Ken Youth Smith, the husband of Sister Lorna Smith, and will be here at Pentecostal Tabernacle. Brother Fitzroy George Mills' mother passed away on Tuesday, August 11th, the funeral service will be held at Oneness Apostolic Church, 18 Federal Road in Spanish Town, and that will be at 11 a.m. And at 4 p.m. on Saturday as well, we will have another youth choir practice. And on Sunday, the 23rd, we have our Youth Sunday. At 6 a.m., we begin with Rightly Dividing the Word on RJR Fame FM. At 7 a.m., prayer time in the sanctuary. At 8 a.m., pre-session. 8.30 a.m., Sunday school. At 10.15 a.m., worship service, children's church, and teen tab and at 6.45 p.m. evening service. Through the period of this week, we'll be, our daily Bible reading will begin at 1 Timothy 1, starting today. And by next week, Sunday, we shall be at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'd like to again welcome all of us to the presence of the Lord. Welcome our visitors. If you have any with us, could you please stand? Anyone visiting with us? also like to welcome those who are joining in our service today from live stream. I hope and expect that today's service will be a blessing to us all. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Well, on Friday of this week, we have women's and men's fellowship services. Now, for the women's fellowship services, we'll be having games, fun, laughter, food, Walk with a little something to buy fritter and bag juice. Come with your board games and come to enjoy yourself. Bag juice, sir. Carl's bag juice. We'll try and get fruit bag juice. Okay, on the 29th of this month, Pentab will have their health and wellness 
fair. Now we'll be having screening services and pamper yourself. Services, some of them, blood sugar, blood sugar control, heart tests, heart disease, the cholesterol, microalbumin, that's the kidney test, hemoglobin, eye screening, Doppler full, um, foot circulation test, and for the diabetic, especially foot care. Now the cost is six fifty for the foot care and five fifty for the food circulation, the foot circulation test. I'm asking that person's register for those two services from the screening services. Please, we need to know how many persons so that we're adequately able to deal with the people. Also, we'll be having pap smears, medical examination, foot detox 2000, reflexology 1000, back massage 1-2. We'll also have pedicure, other services like hair styling. So parents, you can bring out your children for their hairs, for their hair to be styled for school. Now remember, for hair styling, back massage, foot detox, also on this paper, I'd like to have pre-registration. Persons may pre-register with myself, I'm Heather Prendergast, or Sister Yvonne Stewart or any other member of the committee, the Women's Fellowship Committee, if you know them, or members of the clinic committee, please do register. We want to be able to serve you. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everybody. That's a wide range of services. And as the pastor, I believe that I should be able to have all except the pap smear. All other things done free of cost. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But we need to come out and support it. Is that right? Is that right, everybody? Is that right? All right. Just before uh, we receive our offering... We would like to welcome some special people. Uh, the Carr family is here. I know I glimpsed them. All the members of the Carr family. Brother and Sister Carr were members here at Pentecostal Tabernacle many years ago. Sister Carmen Carr is the sister of Brother Albert Norris who passed away some time ago. It's wonderful to have you. Let's clap our hands for them. Wonderful to see you again. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. And then, Sister Marcia Palmer is here, who is the sister of Richie and Jimmy Smith. And Sister Marcia, where are you? Sister Marcia, where? Oh, stand up. Can you stand up? Wonderful. So far back. Let's clap our hands for her. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. And who else is here? Our good friend, Mr. Dern Rainford from Bill's Wholesale in the community. I tell you something. Mr. Rainford is a special friend of Pentecostal Tabernacle. You would not believe how he helps us out sometimes. And a few months ago, he suffered a heart attack, and we were praying for him, and it's just so good to see him. Would you stand, please, sir? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So good to have you, sir. Thank you. And there is, there is, there is no other church for Brother Rainford. Amen, except Pentecostal Tabernacle. Amen. Again, before the offering, I'm going to, we have to say goodbye to some people. I'm going to ask Brother Sabian Stewart just to run down here, please. I, I, I know he's, yes. Oh boy. Can you imagine that people would leave Pentecostal Tabernacle? And where are they going? 
would people why would people leave Jamaica? I, I understand why people would leave Jamaica. I, I really do. I really do. But um, we're just sorry to... Is Stefan here? Stefan, are you here? Come up here, son. Rochelle, would you come, please? Brother and sister Stuart are leaving us to go to England. They will be taking up teaching assignments in England. I'm not very sure how long they are going to be uh, there. I hope it won't be for very long. But they have been here at Pentecostal Tabernacle for, for a little while and have involved themselves in the work of the kingdom. Brother Sabian has served on our evangelism ministry as the assistant director and in other capacities. And Sister Rochelle has served as a member of the worship ministry and um, she has sung on the choir on the praise team and she's even one of the sound technicians so we're really sorry to see them go but that's how it is men will be traveling to and fro in the earth a sign of the last days that's what Jesus said so um we're going to ask them to say a word. Stefan is leaving us for France. But Stefan is coming back. He has a lot of sense. He's not going anywhere for too long. So we're not going to ask him to say anything. Because he's coming back. By next year, he's back. But I'm going to ask Rochelle and Sabian to come and say a word for the Lord. And then we will pray for them. Come, Brother Sabian. Praise the Lord, everyone. I did not see this day coming, even though I did some things that caused, you know, result in us leaving for a short while. Amen? But, uh... The Lord will not take us where his grace cannot keep us. Yes, I, I love Jesus. Yes, and I love my wife as well. Right, and I believe that with God in the vessel, we can smile at any storm. Amen. We worship God here, and we will worship him there. And uh, for the rest of our lives, we will serve the Lord. Amen. We don't know how long this journey will take us, but we can say that God is able to keep that which we have committed to him. Praise the Lord, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm not a good public speaker when it comes to these type of things. I don't know what to say, but I'm going to miss my family dearly. And, um, you know, God has really been good to me. Yes. <laughs> Pray for me. Let's all stand, everybody. We're going to pray for the three of them. Stefan is going to France. He's studying. And uh, we're just uh, believing that the Lord will keep all three of them 
under the shadow of his wings and in his will. We're going to pray for them now. Um, some of the singers, would you just come and stand beside them, please? Let's pray for them. Uh, just stretch your right hand forward as we pray for these precious people in the name of the Lord. all say in the name of Jesus say it again in the name of Jesus thank you so very much uh, you know brethren since I've been a member here at Pentecostal Tabernacle and I've been a member here since 1983 many persons have left I guess maybe hundreds and um the truth is, some of them I don't remember until I go abroad and see them. Let's see if we can remember to pray for these people. Amen? Ushers, would you come, please? We're going to be receiving our tithes and our other offerings. Amen? Here at Pentecostal Tabernacle, we practice tithing. We don't practice tithing because the law says that we should tithe, because we believe that we are not under the law. But we tithe because Abraham, the father of the faithful, gave us an example of tithing when he gave a tenth of all to Melchizedek. And so we don't tithe because of a law. We don't live our lives based on law. We live our lives based on love. We are in a relationship with Jesus. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. So we are not cursing anybody. We are blessing everybody. Would you stand, please? And just... Take one person by the hand and say to them, please try to be faithful to the Lord. Lord Jesus, you have been faithful to us. Lord, it is because of your mercies why we have not died both physically and spiritually. Your mercies are new every morning. Your faithfulness towards us is very great. Lord, we 
recognize that many times we operate as if we are the ones who wake ourselves up in the morning. And we are the ones who give ourselves the strength to go about our daily activities. Sometimes we don't even consider that if you have had not been merciful to us, somebody would have to help us to get up out of the bed or we would not be able to get up at all. Lord, we have known of people who have gone to bed healthy and the next morning they have been paralyzed. It's easy to take you for granted and sometimes you allow us to suffer so we won't take you for granted. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to recognize that you require faithfulness of your stewards. We are bringing our tithes, our faith promise offering, all the pledges we have made, and all the free will offerings that come from a heart of love. And we are giving them to you as a token of our love. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The ushers will direct us to come and our singers and musicians will lead us in worship. If it had not been
Even in the storm, 
That's why. 
very helpful. It's very helpful if we establish a relationship with the peace speaker before we ever have to face a storm. It's good to have a relationship with the peace speaker before you get into a storm. going to very briefly just look at three passages from the word of the Lord. John chapter 11, the first four verses. John chapter 11, the first four verses. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, Behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should give. Glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And finally, Titus, the second chapter. Reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth Salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and Purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You may be seated just for a little while. 
brethren, I want to say very quickly that when we come to Jesus, when we decide to accept him, one of the things we must quickly recognize is that That transaction and what that transaction accomplishes is the glory of God. Because we are human and because we are intrinsically egotistical and self-centered, we think that everything should be about us. Many of us believe that the world is our oyster. And um, the attention should always be on us. I want to say that if you are a Christian, your life has to be about the glory of God. God is more interested in getting glory from your life and from my life than he is in setting you up. Serving Jesus is not a meal ticket. It's not a free ride to anywhere you want to go. It's about the glory of God. And brethren, God is interested in glory. He's jealous for glory. He's desirous of glory. Because when he gets glory, humanity is blessed. So, Lazarus got sick. And the Bible tells us that Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. The fact that he loved Lazarus and his sisters did not prevent Lazarus from getting sick. Because God has glory in his mind. He wants to get glory. And sometimes for him to get glory, I have to get sick. Sometimes for him to get glory. And you see, if he has already gotten glory from my life, the next time he comes, he wants more glory. And that means a stern attest. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego brought glory to God by refusing to compromise their Jewish positions when they were in Babylon. Good. But now God really, what God wants to do is to cause the whole world to worship him because he doesn't want glory from just a few people. And the Bible says that one day the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's what God wants. The earth to be filled with the glory of God. So he says, look, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to put you into fire. I'm going to have to allow you to go into the fire because I want glory. Because when you go into the fire, you see, if I deliver you from going into the fire, that will give me some amount of glory, but not the glory that I am looking for. I am looking for all the world to worship me. And for all the world to worship me, the world has to see that I am an outstanding God. And for the world to see that I am an outstanding God, somebody has to get in trouble. And it just so happens that I've selected the three of you today. But that shouldn't be a problem to you. Because you say you are mine. And I can do anything I want with you. I hear you singing many Sunday nights. Lead on Jesus. I'll go wherever you lead. Well I'm taking you up on that. I'm going to lead into a furnace. 
And I want to hear you singing, I'll go wherever. See, it's easy to sing in abstract. It's harder to sing in reality. It's very easy for me to sing in abstract. But I don't sing so well in reality. Here comes God saying, I need glory, maximum, maximum from your life. And because I need glory, it really doesn't matter in the big scheme of things about you. The wonderful thing about Jesus, folks, is that he finds a way when he glorifies himself to take care of me. And taking care of me doesn't mean that I'll always be happy. Taking care of me means what is best for me as far as he sees it. Some of our preaching and teaching have caused us to be so pampered that we feel that God must just be our boy. And everything we pray for, we must just get it. It's about God, folks. It's not about you or me. So, the king says, I hear that you three boys are not worshipping my image. Now it's as simple as this. I'm going to give you another chance. And if you bow down and worship my image, when you hear the music, it will be well. But if you don't bow down, understand, the furnace is hot as it is. But I'm going to give instructions for it to be heated seven times hotter. So I'm going to turn up the heat. And you all say seven is your perfect number. Well, I'm going to give you perfect heat. You Jews have something about seven. Well, I'm going to show you seven today. Jamaican say nine. Eh? Give you nine days. They said, King, look, our lives are for the glory of God. It really doesn't matter what happens to us. We know that God can deliver us from your hand. We know he can deliver us from the fire. But if not, we will burn up for Jesus. We're not going to bow. We're going to hold steadfast. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. So the king throws them into the fire. Fire doesn't burn them. When the king sees that they are not burnt, he brings them out. And the king, this is the purpose. The king says, look, all my statesmen and legislators, I'm going to draft up a new law. This new law is going to take effect immediately. Every, and folks, when Nebuchadnezzar says, every country that I have dominion over, it's an extensive um, situation. We, when we talk about Babylon being a world power, we're not talking about the United States, you know, that owe $500 billion to China. How you can be a world power and owe so much money? No, man. Nebuchadnezzar would look at the United States as a joke. People were paying money to Nebuchadnezzar. Any city or country Nebuchadnezzar took over, they had to pay tribute to him. He wasn't paying no money to nobody. If, if Nebuchadnezzar wanted ships from a shipbuilding country, he would say, build ship and send, or the whole are dead. Me not pay no for ship. Pay me for send ship to me. That's what we talk about, world power. So don't let the little USA frighten you. Now 
Nebuchadnezzar said, look, in all my empire, as far as it stretches, I'm making a decree. Every person must worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They must. If they don't worship Jehovah, I am going to send my army to where they are and kill them. And turn their house into a garbage heap. And he said, because the reason why I'm doing this, there's a reason. He said, there is no other God that can deliver like this God. He said, all the gods that I know of, that we have been serving all this time, we have seen them deliver from fire. But this God, he delivers even when you're in the fire. This is a God that we must worship. Maximum glory. Now in this case, they didn't die. But now the Lord has a reasoning with Peter. And he says, Peter, do you really love me? With a love that is called out of your heart because I am precious to you. And with that love, are you loving me more than you love your fishing business? Peter says, Lord, I'm fond of you. We are friends. I'm not going to say anything more than that. Because in Peter's mind, he's saying, if me go tell you, say, me love you with that kind of love. You're going to ask me how you deny me. And how you gone back to fishing business. So the Lord realized what was happening. And he said, Pete, do you love me with a love called out of your heart because of my preciousness to you? Forget about more than the fishing business. Will you make any sacrifices to me at all? Maybe you love your business more than me. But do you love me any at all that you would make sacrifices? Peter said, Lord, I'm fond of you. We are friends. I'm not talking about any sacrifices. Because the last time I run my mouth and I say I would be willing to die for you. And even when these others run away from you, I not going to run, I will die. So Peter said, let me stay where I'm safe. I'm fond of you. And then the third time, the Lord used Peter's word and said, Peter, are we even friends? Are you even fond of me? Because based on what I'm seeing, I'm questioning if there's anything between us at all. That's why the Bible says Peter was grieved because now the Lord uses his word. Peter said, Lord, I, I never told you that I have no big love for you. I tell you that I'm fond of you and you know that. Now, in a normal circumstance, if it were us in the position of the Lord, the Lord we would have said, well, you see, since you can't Promise me that you love me that way. Give me back the keys. Let me give it to somebody that can love me strong. Lord said, feed my lambs, Pete. It's you still. I do have no other plan. Still you. And then he said, one day you're going to love me like that, you know. I know you want to love me. And one day you're going to love me like that. Because you see, you're young now. And you get up out of bed yourself. You put on your own clothes. And nobody can tell you where you want to go. But when you get old. Somebody else going to wake you and say, get up boy. And they going to put on your clothes. And they going to carry you where you don't want to go. And they going to turn you upside down. And do you like they do me. And the Bible says, by this saying, Jesus was signifying how Peter 
in his death should glorify God. So this time, for me to get maximum glory, Peter, you're going to have to die. I'm going to have to take you out in order to get glory. Sometimes I don't have to take you out. But sometimes, even your very life, I have to come for so that you can glorify me. Touch your neighbor and tell them you belong to Jesus. You don't belong to your wife or your husband, folks. I'm sorry. You don't belong to yourself. Jesus has the first claim. Nothing before Jesus. Finally, he tells us in Titus that we are the peculiar people of God. Now you know that that word peculiar for us, sometimes it's not a good word. When you use that word peculiar, well, we hardly use it now, but we use other words like strange or odd or weird. Sometimes we even say, I'm kooky or I'm crack. But that's not what Paul meant. What Paul had in mind, the image Paul had in mind, was a dot surrounded by a circle. The circle represents God, and the dot represents the Christian. So, by peculiar, Paul is saying you are like a dot within a circle. He's saying, you see, if you look at it, if you can get a picture of it in your mind, you will see that the circle goes all the way around the dot. You will see that the circle has the dot all to itself. You will see that the dot is Dominated by the circle. Surrounded by the circle. So the dot is peculiar. Because it has a circle all around it. That's what Paul had in mind when he said to, Timothy, to Titus. God wants a peculiar people. That's why he died. See, he wanted a people that he could surround. He wanted a people that he could have all to himself. He wanted a people that he wouldn't share with anybody else or with anything else. Peculiar. He wanted a set of people that she could get glory from. They would understand that they are a dot within a circle. But there's a little more to it than that. If you draw a line, and I think I did do this one time with actual paper. I'm not sure. I did? If you draw a line from outside the circle and come through the circle to the dot, and if you label that a testing or a trial, what you find is that before that testing or trial could touch the dot, it had to come through the circle. So when you are a peculiar child of God, nothing can come to you in the center of God's will until it got through God. So it has to secure the permission of God before it touch you. You can draw any line you want, trial, testing, anything. Here's something that you might want to know. Those who might not know it already. Some of you, I'm sure, know it. Um, if you should read the fullness of what Jesus said to Peter when he said, Simon, Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. It's very, we, we need to understand that. 
Jesus, what Jesus was saying, Satan couldn't just sift you as wheat like that. He had to desire you. The Greek says Satan by asking permission. That's what it means. By asking permission has been given you so that he can sieve you as wheat is sifted in a sieve. I have given him that permission. He couldn't just save you like that. He had to ask me. It had to come through the circle. You realize that the devil wanted to kill Job a long time. He wanted to attack Job and his family a long time, you know. But he said to God, you have made a hedge around him. Job is a peculiar man. You have a hedge around him. And the Bible says, the devil says, and around all that he has. So I have tried on several occasions. Brother Michael, come here. Stand up right there. And just pretend that there's a circle around Brother Michael. So I am the devil. So I want to kill him. Go around the side there. Test him around the side there. All right, I'm going to go behind him, you know. Must get him behind him. Now look. All right, let me try for his sons. Let me try for his daughters. Let me try for his cattle. Can't touch him. Devil say, you have a hedge around everything that he has. How you know? Because I test him in every way and I can't get through. So I'm asking you for permission. Because I realize I can't touch him without getting your permission. So can you give me permission and let us prove if he really loves you just because of you or if he loves you for the likes that you give him. You don't know what is likes. Some of you are too, old, too young. God said, you know what? Go ahead. Because I've been looking for an opportunity to beat up my chest. And show you that I am great. And I can get glory from people. And people love me just because of me. And even when I stop doing anything for them, they still love me. Because they know my character. They have a relationship with me. So he said, do your worst to everything he has. But leave the man. See, God measure it. God said, yes, you, you want to eat him up. But I'm saying, don't touch him. Touch what he has. And the devil got that permission and touched he killed everything Job had. But God wasn't surprised because God knew the devil. And he said, you can't touch what he has. And he said, the devil knew Job too, you know. Because the devil said, put forth your hand and touch all that he has. And he will curse you to your face. He didn't say, put forth your hand and give him a little headache. He said, for you to shake Job, you're going to have to shake everything he has. Because I know Job really standing. So Job is not a man that you tell a lie and him and him backslide. Job is not a man that if you have a little disagreement with him, 
him backslide and said them no love me down there. Job is a man that for him to backslide now, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to kill all his children. You're going to have to wipe out his bank account. You're going to have to mash up him house. And the Lord said, do it. Paul tell us years later, nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord standed sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. I know who I can test. I know who I can put through the ringer. I know who will stand even if they lose everything. And I know those who will leave if you just say a bad thing about them. I know everybody. Job award glory from your life. You don't know about the situation. But somebody has challenged the relationship that we have. Somebody saying you only serve me because I bless you. So I'm, I have to put you on trial job. But I already know that you have what it takes to deal with it. When the reports came in, and all of hell was gathered to have a party. Because everybody feels Job going to leave the church now. Job going to curse God to his face. And we get another one. Job tear his mantle. Lord give it. Lord take it away. Blessed be his name. Blessed be his name. Too many miles behind me. Too many trials gone through. Too many tears had job to remember. Too much to gain to lose. Too many sunsets lie behind the mountain. Too many rivers, brother Job, have gone through. Too many treasures. You think Job didn't know about the treasures? You think Job didn't know about the treasures? I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that the latter day, he will stand on the earth. And though in my body, worm destroy this flesh. Yet with my eyes I shall see God. That's what I'm living for. To see him one day. Next time there was a meeting. The Lord said to the devil come here. Let's talk about Job. God say I can boast. I can boast. I give you permission. I move away the circle. Give you permission to break him down. Still he hold that fast his integrity. The Lord said you want to test him again? Make we test him again. You can touch him now and move away the hedge a little more. You can touch him now, but don't kill him. Do your worst. But don't kill him. Destroy Job's body. Destroy Job's body. Broke him down to nothing. 
Not only that. Not only that. Not only that. It's one thing for you to lose all your children, all your wealth. One thing for you to lose all your health. But if somehow you can feel the presence of God, not too bad. If you can find God, not too bad. Job say, I go forward. Can't find him. Then I go the next direction. Still can't find him. Then I go on the right hand because I hear that him working over here. Still can't find him. He hide himself now. Because if you can't find him there and there and there, he must be here. But when I come here, he hide himself. What you going to do, Job? He know the way that I take. When he has tried me, comfort has gone. So Job, so Job, so poor you're dead. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It's all about the glory of God. Let's stand. Really not about us. So now, if, if, if Brother Moses our brother Andrew, our sister Headley, our brother Damien, somehow, if their evil day comes and they lose everything, then those of us who are in the church must rally around them to comfort them. But in the midst of it, we must ask ourselves, how is God going to get glory in this? Because his glory is after See, the thing is, Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death, but Lazarus died. When he heard that Lazarus was sick, Jesus said, it's not unto death, but the man died. Now, I, I, I am not exactly sure, but I believe what Jesus was saying is, he said, the sickness is not unto death. But for the glory of God, that the Son of Man might be glorified. He's saying, look, the reason for the sickness is not that Lazarus is going to die. That's not the, the real reason. Yes, he's going to die. But he's sick so that I can get glory. That's the main purpose. I need some glory. And I am going to get glory out of this. How you going to get glory out of the man dying who you say you love? And all the way through the process, if Jesus was like me, he would have succumbed. If he didn't have a strong purpose. They said, boy, if you had been here, the man wouldn't die. When him crying, he said, boy, you mean this man that opened the eyes of the blind couldn't prevent this man from dying? Sometimes the church don't understand the operation of Jesus. And we make some negative comments. Because before the thing finish, make the thing play out now, man. Make the thing play out and then you talk. Don't cast negative aspersions at Jesus. He loved him. Then if him love him so much, why him couldn't prevent him from dying? Don't him open the eyes of the blind? The Bible says some... Uh, some Twice or three times in the process, the Bible said Jesus groaned within himself. Why do you think him groan? Just, just the hardness of the heart of the church. Don't understand. Just think it's about them. Jesus said, look, it don't, certain things it don't make no sense. I do no more because I'm not going to get no big time glory because you see them things there all the while. Blind eyes, you're tired to see it done. Deaf ears, tired to see it and stop. Jairus' daughter, dead for a few minutes. I come, 
and wake her up. But I know some of you don't believe that she was really dead. I know. Widow of Nain had a son that died. They were taking him out. In those days, it's not like us. You see, when you're dead, you're buried at the same time. Them no hold you. No, it's true. As you're dead, them just bury you. So, they were taking him out and Jesus passed by and said, get up, man, and gave the man back to his mother. So, he knows that they're going to say, it's a coma he was in, man. He wasn't dead. So, Jesus said, I want glory. And I want glory from my friend. I want glory from the life of my friend. The one who nobody expect I would put through this. Because they love me and I can always go to their home and get welcome. So nobody wouldn't expect me to put my friend through this. Nobody expect me to do this to my brethren. And his sisters that I love. But since I want glory, I go and touch the closest man to me. Sisters didn't even have to sell us or us. He said, the one whom you love. The one, there's a special bond between you and Lazarus. Something special between you. That's what the word means. One who you love is sick. And Jesus said, in order for me to get glory... I going to have to wait. And not only till you're dead, but till you start rotten. I go and wait till you are there four days till maggot start eat you. Everybody know that after a couple of days, the skin start disintegrate. Worms start eat you. So you you're very dead. Your flesh starts to corruption. And why I'm doing this is to show my power so that I can get glory. Not only over death, but over the grave. Because I want to show my church that even if you are, as they said, dead and twice dead and plucked up by the root, I still can work in your life. No matter how terrible your situation is, I can still fix it. When corruption set in, call for Jesus. When they think that you will never rise again, here comes Jesus. When the church forget about you, here comes Jesus. Maximum glory. So folks, as we close today, I want somebody to know it's not about you. God does not have an obligation to come through with all the things on your wish list. God does not have an obligation to satisfy all your desires. God has an obligation to get glory from your life by whatever means possible. So when you start going down, when you hear the news, in the midst of the trauma, in the midst of the heartache, in the midst of the savagery, say, Lord, get some glory from my life. I don't understand everything. You know, I don't understand God. I don't understand God. I read through the book of Job. And when Job was going through his sickness, he had some hard things to say to God and about God. Never blasphemed. But he had some, he cursed the day of his birth. He asked questions of God. And even when God showed up, God rebuked Job. I said, Job, you're talking big. 
but you're talking before the dust settle. Wait till the dust settle, man. I don't finish yet. Wait till you see what I'm doing now. And even though Job said these hard things, when God was dealing with Job's friends, this is what I don't understand. Not fully. The Lord rebuked the friends. I say, you, the friends thought they were defending God's honor, you know. Brethren, we can get it wrong, you know. Especially when people are going through difficult situations. Just come and shut your mouth and pray for them. Don't say nothing. Don't try and give no explanation. Because they thought they were defending God. They said, Job, you, you couldn't talk about God like that. You arrogant and rude. And the Lord said to them, You have not spoken about me the thing that is right as did my servant Job. God said, Job, talk about me the thing that is right. Ask Job to pray for you before I mash you down. Worse than Job. Let him pray for you. I don't want to tear you because if I ever deal with you, no recovery. You said, I'm going to recover Job. Don't speak against my servant. You know why I'm going through this? You was there when the argument happened in heaven. Shut your mouth and leave him. You don't know my business. Don't talk about things that are bigger than you. It's my glory. I put him through for my glory. You telling the man that him sin. The man has done no sin. What are you trying to prove? Leave me alone. The Bible said when they came and he said when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord healed him. Because Job could have said, Oh no, we now pray for you. So now if you come now, come tell me sorry. But Job said, Don't worry, we in it together. I never do so well in the end. So let me pray for you. And the Bible said, when Job prayed for them, when Job finished in prayer, everything Job had, double. Folks, anything you lose in serving God, you're going to get it back. I want to just close now and pray for some people who are going through some difficult stuff. If you just run to the altar so we can pray for you. We're going to pray for Sister Lorna Smith and her children. But that Ken Youth Smith passed away. It is for the glory of God. We must understand that. Sister Carleen Rose lost her husband. Tragic circumstances. Her daughter is bereaved of a good father, good husband. But it's for the glory of God. We have to believe that. Tragic, but God is going to get glory out of it. But the George Mills mother died. It's for the glory of God. God is too good. Sister to Rich mother died. It's for the glory of God. When you don't understand. If you need Jesus when today. You don't know it's if you if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to invite you to this altar. But I want to say to you, come understanding. That your life is going to be for the glory of God. Not so that God can take you out of trouble. Not so that God can set you up. So that God can get glory from your life. God wants to get glory from somebody's life. Anybody in the church, you want Jesus to get glory from your life?
God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't His heart. God is too wise Somebody to needs to give mistaken. your life to Jesus for his glory, not about God you. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't. Trust God's heart. It's not for your destruction. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand. No mistake. No mistake. No mistake. When you don't understand, when you don't know his land, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Sing it again. several people in the altar some of them are not saved but they have come responding to God's word can we ask some of God's people just to come and show an interest in them let's pray for them let's pray for them ladies and gentlemen standing in the altar can we discharge a burden for them just needing God to come alongside and touch them. Yes. Some precious ladies right up front here. Yes. Some men right here. Yes, Lord Jesus. He alone is faithful and 
to him yes tell it to Jesus yes go ahead
about this I often think about that and I know that it would have been more acceptable to Abraham if God had said offer yourself as a sacrifice Abraham would have been more willing to plunge the knife in his own bosom than into the heart of his son that he loved but he understood that God wanted glory. Because you see, folks, it was the practice of the heathen all around whom Abraham lived. They offered their children in sacrifice to their gods. And so God was challenging Abraham. You say you will know the true God. You say you worship the true God. Will you do for the true God what these pagans will do for their false gods? Abraham said, yes. Yes, yes. I will give you all. I will give you all. Oh, if all is one.
for your glory. One songwriter said, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. When there's no more music, I think it says, or when the music stops or something like that. When there's no more music, when there's nothing else. When you get right down to it, it's all about you. All about you. All about you. And the church when come the back to the heart of worship. Fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come. Loving just you.